let's get uh, BYU alum Micah Hanneman on the show. Micah, how the heck are you, man? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to see you, man. Um, you know, yeah. it's interesting as we as we sit here and get ready for the season, as a guy who played for so much of your life, yeah. what is this time of year like for you right now? Oh, it's different. It's a lot different. This is usually the time of the year my life was starting, you know. This yeah, I bet. I, I bet. Camp and everything. Yeah. yeah, and I but think that's one of the interesting because, things when you look at fall camp in this time of year. Isn't there like a fire that burns for you? Isn't there like a – I mean, I would think – and I, obviously I never played fall camp. I never played football. I'm a baseball player. But as a football guy, I would imagine there's got to be a certain burn. There's got to be a certain feeling that you have when this time of year comes up. Like you want to put pads and a helmet on. Oh, yeah, for sure. i got to hold myself back. Now in the in the public life, <laughs> find different ways to relieve some of yeah, that. Yeah, I bet. But let's yeah, let's talk a little bit about it. your time at BYU because I think one of the things that's so interesting is you were at a time at BYU where everything changed. So you play your one year, you go serve a mission, you come back. What do you? How different was the program when you came back? Because you were coming into this window where. Bronco was going out. Kalani is coming in. So you come back from serving. How different was BYU football at that point? Yeah. So when I came back, that was Broncos last year, 2015. And, yeah, that was a that was a surprise that last – right before our bowl game when he announced that he was leaving, you know, and everyone's wondering, you know, who's going to be the next coach, all that. And then there was a huge, huge swing from the difference between the Bronco coaching staff and the Kalani coaching staff. And, you know, pros and cons, it's, it's hard when you have been in, in the same system for a couple of years to make that switch. But I knew in the long run that it was going to be, it was going to be fine. That was going to be a good thing for BYU football. But yeah, it was a big difference. Did you miss, as we talk with uh, BYU alum Micah Hanneman on the Monty show, did you miss Bronco? What was that void like? Because I think we all knew that time was coming. I, I I think it was no secret that he had looked a little bit, he had flirted a little bit, but then when it actually happens and he's not there, I mean, was yeah. there a realization? Was there a moment where you're like, man, this is a different BYU football program now? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, he was there for a long time. You know, he had all sorts of systems in place, everything. He was very military style coaching you know so you kind of knew exactly what you were going to get every time that you showed up that day with Bronco and then not having any coach for a little bit and then going to Sataki where it's a lot more laid back but obviously now he has certain systems in place that that are working well but yeah Bronco I, I really loved playing playing for Bronco he, he did a great job of getting the most out of out of his players you know guys that shouldn't have been as good he made them who they were so yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting. One of the things I and, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, not to live in the past, but I felt like Bronco got a bad rap. I don't know unless you played for him, as obviously you did, but unless you played for him and unless he impacted your life on the level that he impacted your life, I don't think we as as media members, I don't think we as as football fans truly understood or maybe the right word, Micah, is appreciated the impact yeah. that Bronco Mendenhall had on people. Was he undervalued as the coach at BYU? I feel like from an outsider's perspective, he, he was very undervalued. He, he, he was a defensive mastermind, in my opinion. Like, he would call plays right into plays. He, he was a very, very respectable coach. All the players, he had all of their respect. They might not have liked him, but they definitely respected him. And he respected his players as well, so... It was yeah, it was cool. I, I remember one story of Ziggy Odsa. He tried to quit probably three, four times while he was there under Bronco. And Bronco would go to his apartment, you know, show up after he just left practice. And he definitely is like a perfect example of just the type of person that Bronco was. He would not let him quit and he got the most out of him. Ended up working out pretty good for him too. So but yeah. Yeah, did that work out okay for Ziggy? I think it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good decision by him not to quit. Yeah. And then, so it was a different flow when when Kalani showed up. When you look at how he has been, you know, guiding BYU football. I mean, do you do you see do you see progress? I mean, 
when, when as an alumni, as a guy who wore the, the Y on your hat for all those years, like when you look at BYU football now, has Kalani done a good job as a steward of the program? Oh, yeah, 100%. Kalani, I feel like Kalani has all of the aspects that make a good head coach. You know, he might, yeah, he has the recruiting side. He's very personable. I feel like all around, he's he's one of the best head coaches that, that BYU football can have for sure. But yeah, yeah and I, I he, think that's a very difficult job to take. I mean, if you think about it, and again, you were there, and that's why I'm asking you this. I think it's very rare that you have the perspective that you have. But when you look at what Kalani Sataki was asked to do, and you look at taking that job, that's not yeah. an easy job to, A, find a candidate yeah. for and then have a guy that's come in. And I actually give him a lot of credit. I, I, well, I, well, I wouldn't say it's been seamless. I think he's done a really good job building forward. I mean, that's not an easy job to do is to be the head coach at BYU, right? Oh, no way. You have – yeah, everybody, everybody thinks that they're a part of the head coach job. All – so many people that, yeah, he has to deal with. And there's so many different aspects to being a head coach at BYU. People going on missions, people coming back from missions – um on roll stuff like there's so so many different things that other college head coaches don't have to deal with so yeah, yeah I, I have tremendous amount of respect for whoever takes on that job and I, I i love kalani as well you know and him and bronco they're so much different but the love and respect is all it's all the same michael let me ask you this about serving a mission and the the toll that takes because we hear so much about uh, you know, that, hey, they they have a bunch of 30-year-old dads playing football at BYU. <laughs> like, what does that do to you when you – because you played a year, and correct me if I'm wrong, you played a year, then you served two years, I think, in the Carlsbad mission. Like, what is serving – what is that time away from football? A, how does it impact you physically, and how does it change you as a football player? I mean, you kind of – it kind of is a growing up period for sure. So I came back a lot more mature, a lot more focused on – what I wanted to get done, you know, what I wanted to do physically. I was lucky that I was in Carlsbad. So I was eating, I was eating good, you know, in Southern California, there's plenty of, I was eating good over there. Plus I was able to exercise every single day. So I came back. I didn't, I definitely lost a step because you're not out there hitting people or sprinting every single day. And that's, that's where you see a lot of like the joint injury and stuff. But I just, I made it a commit. I ran every single day of my mission just, went on long distance runs just to make sure that my knees were going to be fine when I got home and worked out good. And, but yeah, just the maturity part was the biggest difference. I felt like I came back just a better person all around, which in turn made me a better football player. You know? Wow. That's huge. And yeah. I, I think one of the things that, that we often forget is that there is a, at, at BYU specifically, I mean, nine out of 10 guys in any college program are not going to play in the NFL. They're never going to get a paycheck uh, to strap on a chin strap, right? So, I mean, you go and you serve and you come back. I mean, is, is, your, is your focus on getting ready for the next level? Because, I mean, you wound up signing a free agent contract with the Browns. Yeah. Um, you know, is your, it, where is your focus? Does it change on what you're hoping to accomplish as a football player? So, for me personally – my focus was that's that was my goal was to just be focused 100 percent on football a lot of guys though you see will come home and their focus is they want to get married start having kids and then that obviously will lose focus on football because it's really hard like you said the the amount of people that make it to nfl it has to be everything you know it has to be every single thing that you think about everything that you do every day has to be all focused on football and then throw school in there to it's kind of hard to balance other things than football in school if that's what you're trying to do. But that was, that was my goal and I'm happy with, with what happened. And, but yeah, yeah, I bet you are. We're talking to Michael Hanneman. I mean, so let's talk about NIL a little bit because I, listen, man, I'm a big believer that kids should have every opportunity. I mean, I, I feel like my perspective has always been that, you know, the institution, the NCAA, the school, I mean, they make, they make obviously far more money than the player makes, um, even still today, I think that's the case. But do you feel like NIL, name image likeness, NIL in college, has it has it worked? Do you feel like it supports the player? I think it's a great I think it's a great thing. Cause yeah, it just it just makes sense, right? Like if if somebody's making money off of you, you should be getting some of that money yeah. yourself. You know, especially with the like the the platform that college football has, it's a lot different than when they first came out with those 
with the NCAA rules with no NIL. Nowadays, it's like college is pretty much like you're playing in the NFL, you know, for a lot of these big schools. So, yeah, I always thought it was funny, like, wow, they, they have this guy going and doing photo shoots. They have him up on the billboard for Nike, but he's not seeing any of that money and they're making a bunch of money off him. So I think I think it just makes sense. And I think it's it's going to be I think it's a good thing. Sure. But Micah, they the get players. free socks, man, right? Like, I mean, yeah. the socks are all we're interested in. Yeah. <laughs> right? And but you know, the funny thing is you're a local kid. You're you know, you grew up obviously here in Utah, um, in high school and whatnot. But the funny thing is here for me anyway, the dichotomy, the difference between the what I call the pipeline at BYU that that puts a guy like a, a Baylor Romney at Adobe or puts all these, you know, these BYU alums into business. And the yeah. NIL deals are plentiful. Like they're, you know, Coog Connect is a, is a group that I work with. Um, we're going to have a BYU player on, but I can't even get a phone call with a guy at Utah. Like it is, it is crazy to me how different Utah and BYU is. From a kid that grew up here and played football here, what, are, what were the differences for you when you were looking at those two programs? <laughs> Honestly, in high school, so I was, I, I committed right when BYU offered me. I always, I didn't really, I did grow up a BYU fan. My dad is a big BYU fan, but obviously I was taking both of them. And at the time, BYU was always beating Utah. You know, this was back in 2010 when they were on that long streak. Yeah. And as well as I just like Nike more than Under Armour. So, but <laughs> oh, BYU, wow. going, going to BYU for sure, like all of those connections, there's a huge advantage to let you go on in life meeting people that, that are in business. BYU does a super good job with that. So, Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Now that you're outside of it, right, and now that, that you've, you've, you've become an, a, an adult who actually has responsibilities, right, outside of yeah. football and school and homework and whatnot, has that BYU pipeline helped you? Like, what is that? Give me an inside feel on that. Give me an inside perspective on that. How does the pipeline help you when you, when you played football at BYU? How does that help you outside of football? Just honestly, even just when I, I see, even when I just, people just know that I played football at BYU, it makes them open up more. It's gotten me in the door, you know, my foot in the door. Obviously, it's not going to be everything, but that connection. And BYU, they're always doing socials with different companies. Like they'll have the, the different companies come. We'll have a luncheon. All the players are invited to that luncheon. You don't have to go to it. But if you want to go to it, there's plenty of players that make all these connections at, at these type of things that BYU offers. And there's, yeah, the, the alumni at BYU, they're, they're solid. They're strong, strong alumni. They're BYU till they die, you know? So, yeah. They, and they, I feel like that they understand the type of person that comes from playing college football, you know, the type of discipline, the hard work, all those other attributes that can translate pretty easily over to, whatever job that that they're looking for to hire. Talking BYU football with Micah Hanneman on the Monty Show. Let's get into this uh, this year's club because I think one of the interesting things is this, I don't know what, this grace period where BYU is entering the Big 12 next year. How difficult do you think it is to focus on this season right here and now when you when you have, obviously the Big 12 is in your future, man, but you know how this is. There's a big group of kids on this roster who are never going to play in a Big 12 game. How difficult yeah. is it, do you think, to focus on what's right in front of you? As a player, not I don't think it's difficult at all for, for a player just to focus on their first game, you know, game, game by game. The coaches always do a good job, but that is exciting. Um, they have a tough schedule. They have a Big 12-type schedule this year, which is – exciting to see um that big 12 stuff though that's that's going to be that's going to be awesome i hope i'm looking forward to it it's hard for me to focus on this season but i know as a player i have a little brother on the team they i bet they don't even talk about that in the locker room maybe it comes up every now and then but they're they're focused on the week by week game by game for sure yeah, you better be because you got to be Baylor. You got to get revenge on yeah. Baylor, right? Like, yeah. But one of the things I find so interesting is I think one of the stories that we've really got to focus on this year is how good is this secondary going to be? You're a guy that played safety at BYU. You're white, so you're slow, so you can't <laughs> compete. Like, how much of that did you hear? Like, how much about the <laughs> lack of athleticism uh, and the ability to be a track star? How much of that did you hear playing at BYU? A good amount, yeah. 
for sure a good amount. I think I, I was, at some point somebody told me I was the only white corner in the NCAA, which is <laughs> pretty yeah. funny. But but yeah, for sure you you definitely hear that. Um, yeah, I don't really know if that matters, but it seems to be the thing that that everybody likes to talk about BYU. They got a bunch of white white DBs that that yeah. can't run. But well, yeah. and I I think that stigma is one that is when you talk about recruiting and you talk about. You know, obviously here in Utah, you know, I, I think it's it's BYU is unquestioned, but you go out and you got to win battles in Texas, California, Florida, the Southeast. You got to get linemen out of the Northeast. Like when you're recruiting nationally, I think those stigmas matter. So that's why I say, like, I feel like a key to this team this year, and I don't know your thoughts on it, but I think a key to this defense this year is, are they going to be forced to play nickel and dime a lot? Do you actually, in your opinion, now, Michael, do you think BYU has a back end of this defense that, that can compete? You know, I guess we'll find out. But in my opinion, I feel like, yeah, they they definitely can compete. I hope that they're able to play man because if you can't play man, then that makes that makes defense really hard. And if you if you have dudes that can man up against dudes, that makes things easier for everybody. You know, we 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 were lucky. We had we had a couple of white white dudes, and we had a lot of scrutiny before our season when I was there. But we were able to play man ninety percent of the time, which I feel like helped out our defense. But oh, it, I think you have they, to, especially yeah. when you have the potential. And I know that's a, a dirty word, right? Potential. <laughs> but when you have the potential that BYU has in this linebacker core, when you have, especially when you look on the offensive side of the football, I mean, you have, I think you probably have seven, eight guys legitimately that can compete for a starting spot on this offensive line. You have a really good quarterback. I think, you know, obviously Christopher Brooks is coming in with a lot of anticipation that's why I say, man, I think if, if you can really keep your health high, if you could keep guys on the field, there's no reason that this defense shouldn't compete, right? Like when you look at this schedule, there's no reason you can't step out on the field against South Florida, against Baylor. I mean, everybody talks about Notre Dame. There's no reason with the talent that this team has, Micah, I believe they should be able to step out on the field and, and win games just about against anybody. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And definitely that – that middle part the the base of their defense the linebackers the the line is always going to be BYU staple and then it's always a question mark about the DBs right but I feel like the DBs are solid I've seen I've seen them putting in their work and the recruiting on that end as well has been been getting a lot better with with Sataki in there they yeah they they have they have a lot more depth than I feel like that they've ever had at DB it might not be people that everybody is talking about but they definitely have a lot more depth which you're right that's always been a problem when there's when there gets injuries on the defense that drop off from the starter to the second string is usually a pretty pretty big drop off but I feel like that's one of the biggest things that's changed since I've been there yeah it's just that hey Raphael on our show wants to know uh one of our listeners wants to know what are your expectations for BYU this year oh the same better better than last year there can't be any expectations less than that so I'm expecting them to finish, you know, top 10, get invited to a bowl game. It's been a while since they've been invited to a bowl game. So I'm hoping to see that. Yeah, absolutely. And, hey, by the way, before I let you go, how, how what did you think of Jamal Williams' speech to his, his Detroit Lions teammates? I mean, obviously, that is a viral bite floating around where he yeah. talked about the record and losing games. And yeah. I thought that was one of the – the best moments, and I know this probably sounds grandiose or whatever, but that might be one of the best moments in the history of Hard Knocks. That was a, I, I was yeah. inspired by that. I wanted to get up and go for a run. Like, what did yeah. what did you think of that speech he gave there? Oh, man, I love I loved playing with Jamal, his passion and everything. Yeah, that definitely fired me up, gave me butterflies, some fire. Man, he's, yeah, that that's pretty cool for him. But isn't that you know? who he is, though? That's, that's not like is. an act he's, for him. No, that's 100% he doesn't. He does not, yeah, he doesn't act. That's who Jamal is. Yep. Super passionate about about everything that he does. So Yeah. Hey, before be I around. let you go, what are you doing now? Like tell me about your life. What are you what are you working on? Shoot, man. Um right now I've been working for this company, startup company called Ride Off SLC. I've been managing. They have about sixty five cars up in Salt Lake that that we manage out rental. But yeah, I just had my first baby, baby boy a couple of months ago. So that's been that's been an experience for sure. But yeah, and now you're old. You had a birthday good. yesterday, right? Yeah, 
birthday yesterday. That a boy still living well. It old. looks like you look yeah. great, by the way. Good to see you. I, <laughs> and I just you. want to say, hey, thanks. I know this is the first time we've met. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for yeah. coming on the show. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. Yeah, you bet, man. Talk to you soon. Yeah. All right. There you go. Micah Hanneman, uh, BYU alum. Good dude. Good dude. Good conversation. Really, really enjoyed that. I mean, what do you take away from what do you uh, what do you take away from that conversation, Jake? Yeah, I mean, clearly, um, you know, a lot of passion, as you would expect, right? I, I think that that the the Kalani versus Bronco conversation is really interesting. You know, those those days for BYU were very different than what what BYU is doing now, and and I have to say, I do agree with Micah that. Bronco was underappreciated. I think Bronco, you know, uh, maybe misunderstood is a is better verbiage to describe Bronco in that program at that time. But I I just think that that back in that day, you know, five eight years ago, like BYU was just in such a different place. And I think it's amazing to see what they've been able to do, mainly because Bronco laid that path. You know, Bronco laid that foundation. And I think you know when you have guys like like Micah who who were there at that time. They understand what what Bronco did and and how all that went down versus where the program's been able to go. So I just I, I think it's really cool when you get perspective of someone who was there at that time but now sees what the program is and can kind of you know bridge that gap from that side of the of the of the conversation. So yeah, I thought that, that was great. Riley O'Brien with a five dollar tip says shout out to Micah with love from Riley, Bobby, and Rob Terry. Great interview, Monty. Appreciate you, Riley. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it was fun talking to him and I, I think your point about Bronco right there is hugely important. I know that Bronco is one of the most controversial figures in BYU recent history. Mm -hmm. And I do think he was underappreciated. That's why I asked that question. I think I I I think we all knew in the last three to yeah, really the last three years, Bronco was at BYU. He had opportunities to leave, and he almost took them. Mm -hmm. And so it was not a shock when he left. It was not. And I think the the uncertainty that was created by that gap that Micah talked about, like, hey, we don't have a coach right now. Yeah, we don't have a coach right now. What are we doing? And then you bring in a guy like Kalani Sataki, who could not be more different than Bronco Mendenhall. The flip that you went from a hard-charging, like really structured dude in Bronco Mendenhall to a more laid-back, a more personal, a more one-on-one -on -one guy in Kalani Sataki, and the staff that Kalani surrounded himself with, I think you saw immediate benefits of that. I think you saw immediate wins talent-wise. Now, obviously, the schedule was still very difficult. You lost a ton of games. But now I think you're seeing the fruits of all of that labor. So I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad thing that Bronco left, but without question. Yeah. There was a huge hole the day that Bronco Mendenhall left. Yeah. And I don't know that we still appreciate the work and the the growth that took place under Bronco Mendenhall's stewardship. And I think independence, Bronco's a huge part of the success of the independence of this program. You know, obviously the interview with the Austin American Statesman, the, the courting of the Big 12, the rejection from the Big 12, like... All of those things and all of that emotion that went into, you know, hey, how did you, you know, how did you feel about, you know, Bronco leaving? I think a lot of that emotion was injected into the way that the Big 12 was handled, but I yes. also don't think there's any doubt. And I know it's probably not popular in BYU country. Bronco Mendenhall is one of the most influential figures in the history of BYU football. Yeah. And I think the work that he did, the effort that he made, to grow the BYU brand was tremendous and it'll never be appreciated. Now, on the flip side of that, the growth and the explosion of BYU football that we've seen under Kalani Sataki is, is nothing short of sensational. Yes. This is a huge year for BYU football. I can only say that so many times. This year could likely define success or failure in the Big 12. Totally. I, I think you've got to have a huge recruiting year. You've got to be on the recruiting trail consistently. You've got to be winning at recruiting consistently. This is an incredibly important time. You have won. You have done. You have accomplished nothing. Nothing. Because as far as the Big 12 is concerned, whatever you did before kickoff of next season is irrelevant. Fast. 1984 doesn't mean a damn thing to anybody in Stillwater. Correct. It means nothing to anybody in Manhattan, Kansas. It means nothing to anybody in Lawrence. Like, nothing to Cincinnati, to Houston, it means nothing. 
And that's a tough pill to swallow. You wanted so badly to be in the Big 12. Well, guess what? Now you're in the Big 12. Now what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. That, to me, that's one of the most important discussions that, that we will have this entire season. You've got to watch the recruits who are on the sideline. How many of those kids are you going to win because you've got the XII on your chest? Right? How many of those kids are going to BYU instead of going somewhere else because you're going to play in the Big 12? And furthermore, if we're, if we're truth-telling, how many of those kids are going to pick BYU instead of Utah, especially locally? How many of those kids are going to pick BYU over Utah because of the instability of the Pac-12 versus the, the perceived stability of the Big 12? Yeah. yeah. Perception is reality. Big 12 yeah. is probably no better off than the Pac-12, let's be honest. How many of those kids are going to take the Big 12 over the Pac-12? I think a significant number. I think a significant number. Uh, Robert says, Bronco uh, brought BYU out of the, the cotton years. I don't know what you mean by that. Totally agree with you about BYU football, uh, K. Nuren says. Ro Croton years. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, some there's... <laughs> I don't have to detail the, the end yeah. of the Croton era yeah. in those uniforms. Good Lord, the bib uniforms, please, please. Have some mercy on us all with those bib uniforms. Okay, real quick. Uh, so Shams is tweeting about uh, the NBA schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make, sure uh, make sure that we get to this because I think this is a big deal. Um, two notable early season games. Box and Giannis open against the Sixers on the road. October 20th Celtics and heat October 21st in a rematch of the Eastern conference finals. And then on Martin Luther King day, January 16th heat versus Hawks in Atlanta and sons at Grizzlies in Memphis. So those are huge, huge. Yeah. Those are big games. Yeah. I mean, the NBA is definitely trying to match make here. You know, you're trying oh, to make big matches. No doubt. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think they are. Uh, Teddy Wayman with a $5 tip. Hey, guys, Alma just said he's meeting you today. I appreciate you hitting us up. The show is awesome. Yeah. Alma is meeting us today. At top secret. Top secret. It Take is it classified. Easy. Take it easy. I'm not trying to be cryptic. Yeah, Wayman Brothers Construction. You need a contractor. There's few better than Alma Wayman. Now, Teddy, eh, Teddy's a little questionable of character. You don't really want him in your home. The smell alone is a problem. Pack your shit. Let's I'm, go. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding, Teddy. <laughs> Joking with you. But, uh, yeah, Allman, uh, Wayman Brothers Construction, Alma Wayman and his crew yeah. have done a lot of work on my house. They don't advertise on the show, by the way, but uh, Teddy listens. I'm telling you, you need a contractor called Wayman Brothers because yep. uh, they're awesome. So I guess that's it. Speaking that's of it, man. Alma, that's it, Skippy. Pack your stuff. Yeah. Um, tomorrow on the show, I'll save it. Tomorrow on the show, we'll have uh, we'll talk a lot more Salt Lake City sports right here on YouTube. Tune in. Yeah, a lot more coming up tomorrow on the show. Um, back to our normal ending. No meeting on the books. Um, I'll have the latest on the Jazz for you because I think there's. There's going to be an announcement this week from the Jazz that I think is really interesting. We'll see what that is. We'll see what you guys think of that. More on college football. I have no <laughs> idea. Deshaun Watson. Oh, we didn't get to Deshaun today. Tomorrow. Heated debate tomorrow. on Deshaun Watson. Heated because Jake and I are on opposite sides of the Deshaun Watson thing. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Make sure you go say hi to our friends at Barbecue Pit Stop. Any of their five Utah locations, Logan, Leighton, Lehigh, Murray, and St. George. Enter to win the BYU driveway. It's on the box, in the box, on the counters at all Barbecue Pit Stops. Come join us at Lehigh on September 17th. And, of course, you need mortgage advice, real estate. Call my guy, Debra Davis, at Academy Mortgage, 801-543-9666. Until tomorrow, say goodbye, Jake. Goodbye, Jake.